welcome to Themis Podcasts. Themis is a risk management firm specialising in financial crime. Our aim of these podcasts is to bring you interesting news, interviews and recordings of our exclusive events from the world of financial crime. Detect and disrupt. Intelligence sharing to tackle modern slavery and human trafficking. In this podcast, we are joined by George Zanaris, Intelligence Manager at NatWest Group's Threat Mitigation Unit, and Nick Mays, UK Manager of Global Security at Western Union. Both have extensive experience in public and private sector intelligence sharing and leveraging data to tackle modern slavery. We discuss the challenges faced by organisations, as well as the best practices businesses can enact to ensure that when they detect signs of modern slavery and human trafficking, these crimes are swiftly disrupted. Hello and welcome to this Themis podcast, Detecting and Disrupting Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking. Today I'm joined by Nick Mays, who is a Law Enforcement Outreach and Investigations Manager for the UK at Western Union, the world's leading international money transfer business. Nick joined Western Union from the Metropolitan Police's National Terrorist Financial Investigation Unit. We are also joined by George Sinaris, who is the Intelligence Lead at the Financial Intelligence Union, our unit at NatWest Group. George is also a former Metropolitan Police Officer, where he served on the Proactive Money Laundering Task Force and the Fraud Squad. Um, Welcome, George, and welcome, Nick. Um, So, thanks, guys. Um, So the purpose of today is to explain um, how firms can leverage their own data to help identify the signs of modern slavery which sit within it and help tackle the problem, and dealing with a public-private partnership, which is very much the emphasis on tackling this problem and making law enforcement aware of it. Um, So, George, I think starting with you, it'd be really interesting to hear your experience of public-private sector intelligence sharing about modern slavery and human trafficking and where you find the best practices are in, in, in this sort of method. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think in the grand scheme of things, all the public-private partnerships that are out there at the moment, this is probably one of the strongest thematic areas that we have. Um, it has been going for quite some time. I think pretty much when the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force started. So um, we have a really well-developed understanding of the different typologies involved in modern slavery and human trafficking. Um, And that's developed over the years, um, and that collaboration has worked really well. Um, For me, I think the main main thing to consider when you're exchanging intelligence is making sure we, we use the intelligence cycle. So for me, it's very important that we understand what's directing us to look in certain areas um, you know what, what's guiding us to look at particular themes is it the national risk assessment is it uh, requests from um, members of the government that have seen it as a priority as Theresa May did back, back a few years ago um, and then making sure that we collect that information from the right sources um, and obviously law enforcement is a key area for that who add the context to what we're seeing in a financial institution. I think looking at um, external industry bodies as well, uh, and the GLAA who who monitor a lot of those key industries, it's very important to get those insights, and also just public source information that we see out there is very useful. And then the next part for me is really making sure that as a group, we analyze that information, make sure that it's useful, accurate, um, and we, disseminate it in a timely way and in a method that would suit that target audience and so they understand what they need to do with it um, and how relevant it is to, to what they're doing and, and what they're seeing. And then I suppose the, the big thing is how we react to all of that. So what feedback uh, are we giving each other around that intelligence and, and how does it impact on, on what we do going forward as a group and in our respective organisations and how can we do it better next time and what have we learned from those um, lessons, from those cases that we've analysed? So for me, that's like the key aspect of what we're trying to achieve in this in this sort of partnership forum. Sure. And I mean, when you're going through that sort of process, what are the sort of typical intelligence points you tend to find you're sharing? So I think there, there are a key um, 
payment references that we might see or types of uh, transactions that we might see and and a lot of it is to do with the behavior of the actual participants as well so um, for instance we might be looking at certain payments to um, adult service websites um, where where women are sexually exploited and advertised um, looking for a disproportionate amount of payments to things like um, cheap airlines um, and coaches so a lot of those things when you bring a lot of those indicators together on their own they are not particularly suspicious but if you bring them all together um, that's where that suspicion would be created especially when it's above the normal distribution curve um, so those are the sorts of things that we would exchange intelligence on um, and also um, we'll also talk about uh, ways our uh, respective organisations have tried to educate um, staff to make sure that we are able to detect those indicators. Right, thanks. And so Nick, I guess from your point of view, uh, in a money service business, your, your risk profile is slightly different. Um, how do you find the process of public-private sector intelligence sharing, uh, given, your, given your role at Western Union? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting what George was was saying, particularly whether it's around um, analysing adult sex websites or, or cheap airlines. You know, risk in indicators such as those, which perhaps in isolation might not be hugely significant, but then if you aggregate those risk indicators with information intelligence through um, other partners, through say the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, then you know, those risk indicators can evolve into, into clear or, or clear red flags. So I think, you know, just kind of following on from what, what George was saying there, I mean, there's the, there's the operational, I'll call it the gimlet, the yeah. acronym for Joint Mind Laundry Intelligence Task Force, and then there's the strategic side of things. So I think probably uh, globally, um, the gimlet is probably renowned for providing, I mean, this, this has been legislated for, the gimlet provides a, a legal gateway through which law enforcement and financial institutions can share personal and, and, and financial data around priority crimes, one of which is uh, modern slavery human trafficking. And then there's the, uh, there are the strategic expert working groups, one of which is the modern slavery human trafficking group. So I think from, a, from, a, from an operational level uh, where live cases are discussed, we receive uh, law enforcement requests in relation to ongoing live investigations, um, this is fantastic, and you know it gives probably it gives uh, as far as George is concerned within the NatWest Group or at Western Union or, or the, the the collective of other financial institutions it gives us a, a sort of a unique and unparalleled ability to be able to assess our exposure to uh, to, to these crimes and then uh, employ the necessary risk mitigation actions. But I guess. Um, Perhaps because you know, the, the gym has been running now for, for some years, since, since 2015, I think a possible challenge is, exists around um, uh, de-risking. So, you know, in other words, um, where members of the gym, whether it be uh, the NatWest Group or Western Union or, or anyone else, where we find exposure based on uh, law enforcement requests, be it modern slavery, human trafficking investigations or, or others, um, you know, we live in quite risk-averse times now, and I think often the, the default position for uh, for us as as businesses, as financial institutions, is to uh, is to make that business decision to offboard or exit relationships. Now, um, that in turn, as you would expect, may well uh, prejudice the investigation. So it's finding that balance between. Uh, identifying risk within our organizations for, for George and myself, and then balancing that with the needs of law enforcement. I think um, perhaps in the, in the strategic expert working groups, so George and I both uh, represent on the Modern Slavery Human Trafficking Group, um, those are different in the sense that um, operational cases, live cases, tactical information isn't shared. We, we discuss uh, typologies and best practices, strategic information, and I think those four are, are absolutely fantastic. But of course, you know, again, there are limitations with discussing live cases. So, oftentimes, previous cases uh, are cited for our learning, and, and and that is fantastic. But um, you know, to 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 
glean some risk indicators associated with human trafficking, but I think an obvious reality of that is that um, you know, the manner in which criminals operate operate within uh, human trafficking networks, they're continually evolving. So it, it's, it's challenging to keep up to date with these typologies. So you know, we want and need to uh, get that intelligence from uh, law enforcement and other partners in relation to current live cases, but often there are limitations, sensitivities around how we can share uh, live information and, and, and current typologies. Right. Is that? Do you think that's a case of being the sort of proverbial mushrooms, or is there a sort of real operational need not to share the sort of information? Do you think? I think it's. Uh, I think it may. It, it may be both, and um, I think you know perhaps in the in the context of a of a global pandemic, it's probably. I mean, you know, George may well attest to this himself. I think there has been uh, some of a, a, a decrease in the number of cases that have been brought to the gym that table. Now, that may well be the case of the practicalities and challenges that COVID has brought, but equally, um, one might be uh, somewhat cynical and say, well, you know, if law enforcement are bringing live cases to the table where they have a, a captive audience of a, a collective of financial institutions, they are businesses and, you know, they will make business decisions based on risks. So yeah. is, there a, is, is there a challenge there with the, our law enforcement perhaps arguably reticent to come to the table knowing that um, a business will make a business decision based on their current or, or, uh, or act, perceived actual risks of that investigation? Okay. Thanks. That's 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 really interesting. Just to sort of hear the sort of first hand point of view of dealing with the public private sector intelligence and the sort of challenges you can face in this scenario. Um, George, going back to you and sort of detecting modern slavery and human trafficking in a bank. Um, I know when you joined NatWest, um, there are some sort of procedures you've you've sought to implement um, to help detect the um, indicators. Uh, I wondered if you could talk to us a bit about what was potentially being missed and how, by bringing in new pra intelligence practices, um, you've been able to pick up new, new um, topics? I think, for me, it was um, the awareness was, was the issue where we're, we're a very large bank um, and we've got over, well, I think, I'm not sure we've got so many now, but we, we, we certainly had around 750 branches around the country. Um, and that's a, a huge amount um, to to raise awareness through um, so it comes with challenges and, and branch staff are very much um, under the cosh at the moment um, you know they've got a lot of challenges and they're, they're, they're busy especially with the limited hours now as well so that, that means that it's a challenge getting that information out there because they don't have a lot of time so um, for me that was one key piece that was missing um, also, I started introducing uh, webinars into um, the bank as well. So we started doing um, live presentations to key uh, stakeholders across the bank. And some of those will be already in financial crime from a first line and second line perspective. And some of them will be our fraud colleagues um, who may not necessarily see uh, or recognize the crossover between fraud uh, and modern slavery, which is definitely the case from my experience, yeah. uh, and I'm sure from the experience of most of the group that uh, Nick and I are involved in. Um, so it was really about making sure that um, that awareness was raised to the maximum level. So one of the things we, we introduced was um, workshops across all of our branches last year, uh, making sure that they understand what the signs are, um, to spot the signs from both the victim and suspect perspective of people coming into the branch. And one of the, the common indicators that we would see is somebody acting as a translator um, for a customer that wishes to open an account or conduct some sort of transaction. And often uh, the, other, the translator, in inverted commas, will be in control of their um, personal documents. Uh, they may have a mobile phone that they're controlling on behalf of the customer as well. Um, and actually, it, you know, it could be innocent if it's actually a genuine friend or member of the family assisting someone, that's perfectly understandable, but um, a lot of these people appear to be quite vulnerable in different ways. Um, you know, it could be someone that may be um, homeless, it could be someone that um, has got some mental health issues, um, and it could be just someone that's generally vulnerable in different ways. 
Um, so we wanted to make sure that our staff were aware of that. And um, we found that when we conducted the workshops, which some of them I participated in, um, people had seen this sort of methodology and behaviour in the branch and didn't really think about modern slavery. We made sure that there was lots of resources on our intranet available. So if you typed in, you know, modern slavery or human trafficking, lots of guidance will come up that we prepared in our team. Uh, we've got an electronic um, sort of virtual assistant as well. Um, that if you ask them a question about modern slavery, all of our material uh, and, and sharing of knowledge will come up. Um, so we made sure that that was in place as well. So when they received the workshop training, they had the resource to go to. And then what we found was lots of um, internal SARS were being raised um, and actually some investigations took place within RFIU. Uh, so it was really successful just raising that awareness and, and making people more aware of, of what to look for. Um, and one of the, one of the things that... Um, our bank does and I'm sure other banks do as well is uh, you know if we have someone that's coming into a branch that um, is trying to do all the talking for someone that apparently can't speak English we will make sure that the customer is the person we deal with and we'll use a language line that we have in place to make sure that they're rooted through that language line and dealt with directly um, where there will be a translator uh, on the call to to help direct them into doing whatever they need to do in the branch. So those are that's an example of um, the type of awareness raising that we took part in over the last couple of years. Right. Um, and George, I guess just briefly before we go back to Nick, um, with people obviously not going physically into branches anymore, have you adapted this in, in light of the sort of pandemic? Uh, we. Sorry, was that aimed? Sorry, at that was that was aimed at you, George. Sorry, yeah, just um, I guess because oh, yeah, yeah. So I think what we have done is um, we've tried to introduce a more proactive approach to detecting things because obviously, um, as you said, you know, people are going into branches less and less, but they are still going into branches, um, and so as a as a team, as an intelligence team, us being aware of what indicators to look for. We're now trying to produce a tool that helps us proactively detect customers that may be victims or suspects of modern slavery. And sometimes it's very hard to differentiate between the two because there is an element of control over those accounts that mm -hmm. are being operated. Um, and that what that will enable us to do is direct um, maybe the you know top fifty accounts that we think are the most prevalent. Uh, in that group of customers and make sure that they are looked at from a review perspective, account review perspective, and or if it's really significantly obvious that, that they're involved in, in that sort of uh, typology, we would look to investigate those accounts um, and, and probably uh, disclose to the NCA. So that's the approach we're trying to take at the moment and it has been developing over the last couple of years and we're starting to see some good results from that as well. Okay, that's 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 great. Um, so Nick, I, moving moving on to you um, again, I guess a slightly different risk profile with um, Western Union. Um, how are you looking to detect modern slavery um, in the business? I'm thinking in particular when you have you know migrant workers sending remittances back, for instance. Um, what what have been the sort of challenges you're facing, and what are you what are you looking to detect? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, start. Started off with migrant. I mean, migrant workers are a significant uh, customer segment for us. You know, and and you know there are um, numerous permutations of uh, sending money from A to B. And we are Western Union is the you know it's 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 one of the, it's a global leader in cross border cross country money transfer. And a lot of those a lot of our products and services are geared up for those migrant workers. You know, and just in the UK and some of the big cities. Um, you know, there are a huge uh, diaspora of, uh, of migrant workers looking to send money back to uh, back to their home countries. And, you know, let's not forget that, I don't know what the figures are, but a significant portion of the world's population still don't have access to uh, mainstream banking infrastructure. So, you know, I think that the, 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 the common uh, public, or not just public, but throughout uh, the public partnerships we engage with, the perception is that uh, Western Union largely operates a number of 
physical agents um, and one would go into an agent with cash to send money and that would be received um, at, the, uh, at the other end. Uh, that is that is true, and it's, an, uh, and it's a vital essential service, especially for the migrant workers, as you say. But you know, in addition to that, you know, we we have a network of agents located in some like two hundred countries and territories. You know, we, we operate digital channels. Uh, uh, we can send and receive money through mobile wallets, and then there are we provide payment solutions for businesses as well. So the reason I say that is because uh, you know we have a huge global presence, a uh, huge network of agents. And, you know, with that comes huge responsibility. And, you know, it's, I guess we have um, an advantage, if that's the, the right word, it's from a kind of a, a public-private partnership and risk mitigation. You know, we have a kind of a, a unique global helicopter view of all, of all transactions. So, um, I mean, we're not, we're not a bank. We don't, we don't operate accounts currently in the, in the, in the sort of the banking sense but um in other ways you know, we are we are a closed loop western union you know, there is a there is a sender and there is a, a receiver and i think uh just just going back to your to your question about how we how we can detect um illicit transactions in our network you know we we won't just look at nick sending money to george or george sending money to henry we'll say, well who else has nick been sending money to and and who in turn has george been sending money to and very quickly we can build out the consumer uh, network and um, identify risks and questionable activity within those networks. And I think, particularly from a from a from modern slavery human trafficking perspective, Western Union has a, a has a I guess a, a bespoke and very developed anti human trafficking initiative. And um, I guess the, the the central pillars of that are based around and you know it, it it's. It goes back to what we were talking at the start, you know, in relation to uh, the numerous public-private partnerships that, that, that George and I are both engaged with. The central pillars of our anti-human trafficking initiative are engaging with uh, law enforcement because, you know, we, George and I both come from a law enforcement background, so we, we know and recognise the, 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 the value of the intelligence that law enforcement can provide, and we have a very robust compliance regime, but we use the intelligence from our law enforcement partners to augment um, our already uh, robust compliance regimes. So we, we have that relationship with law enforcement. Um, essentially, they know or suspect who the bad actors are. We, we work with non-profits. We work with um, industry peers around that. So having those, that, those pillars is essential um, to our anti-human trafficking um, initiative. Um, and I think you know before we before we went on air, you, you talked about um, recently we've had engagement with uh, a non-profit, uh, the the Child Q Coalition, and their you know you you'll know their their mission is to uh, their U.S. base and they their mission is to rescue children from, uh, from from sexual abuse by building technology for uh, for law enforcement. But they've worked with Western Union uh, and you know working with their uh, provided unique data to supplement our anti-human trafficking. Initiative. So it's not. It's. I think in answer to your question, it's not just being siloed and approaching the the issues and challenges uh, in in one sense. I think the key is to engage a whole host of different partners and to to use that to constantly upgrade our, our current risk mitigation tools. Um, and yeah, I mean it's it's it, it is a challenge. Just as I say, just by virtue of how big we are, where we operate. But you know these. Working partnership with all these uh, all these different organisations is, is paramount to, to for our initiatives. Okay, because I think it'd be it'd be really interesting to sort of have un, sort of understanding of what is a sort of typical red flag sort of thrown up in terms of an, a, a modern slavery red flag in your business, and then the sort of process for dealing with it. Well, I mean, uh, um, again, you know. Uh, Western Union is, Western Union's products and services are, you know, we are an unwitting financial enabler of uh, many different crimes. That's a reality. But what's important is what we do, the systems we put in place and who we work with to mitigate those risks. So I guess in answer to your question, um, and this is probably one of the benefits of the modern slavery human trafficking Jimlet expert working group, because I believe I made reference to this um, at one of the groups, and it was a, it was a, uh, an example, a case study based on a uh, an historic 
case, and it's in the in the realm of uh, sexual exploitation. So, for example, and this probably feeds into your question on migrant workers as well. So, um, an issue for probably for, all, for not just West Ham, but financial institutions is uh, vulnerable Eastern European women being trafficked through mainland Europe uh, into the UK through a variety of, of, of different means. Now, um, now George George had alluded earlier to. Um, uh, adult sex website, that sort of thing. Now we, I'm sure, uh, the NatWest group, and we, you know, we do plenty of uh, open source research around this. Uh, 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 a, ri a risk indicator in this context might be okay. There may well be multiple different uh, consumers who are using the same telephone number. There may be multiple consumers using the same address or or ID. And because, because Western Union's network is so prevalent, we can almost, using financial data, using the financial transactions, we can almost track vulnerable women, victims from source country, follow their, look, look, at, their transaction, uh, look at their transactions through mainland Europe into the UK. And it's a sad reality. And this, I guess this has taught us that you know, a lot of times the, these, uh, these women, these vulnerable women are commodities and, and, and the organized criminal groups use these uh, women as commodities and through financial uh, investigation we can track their movements through, uh, through Europe into the destination country. So I guess what the, the, the challenge is, now in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, there are, there are very few red flags in the sense that if you see this, that equals that. You know, I, I think there are many risk indicators that might merit further investigation, but this is a classic example. So, and as George was saying earlier, some of these risk indicators in isolation might not mean that much, but aggregate them together and then aggregate them on top of other financial institutions, other organizations' intelligence, and then it becomes a, a much a much clearer picture. So, so yes, you know, I, perhaps sexual exploitation is uh, an area where uh, the risk indicators, red flags are are easier but then the challenge is how do you how do you disaggregate the genuine uh, transactions from the illicit transactions and how do you uh, how do you disassociate uh, a trend a, a transaction from uh, a, a victim a vulnerable person to a family member as opposed to a victim to someone who is clearly part of an organized criminal group so these these are these are the challenges that we see okay great thanks nick and i think that's that's really good overview of why the sort of public-private partnership is so important given the access to data that firms such as Western Union or NatWest will have. You can see why it's so vital for law enforcement. Um, I think just for in the sort of last five minutes, um, it'd be really interesting just I think for our listeners to understand a bit more about how does what is the best way of ensuring a smooth operation with the sort of public-private partnership and the sort of smooth reporting lines? Um, how, how is it best for firms to engage with the public sector? Um, George, would you be able to take that? Um, yeah, I think for me, what, we've got a good relationship with with law enforcement and the public sector, but I think what's missing, and it, you know, it, it's something that can't be helped in many ways due to the current financial situation we find the globe in at the moment. But there needs to be more resources uh, in. In, in law enforcement in order to conduct financial investigations um, and that's not just the police that's you know what the wider law enforcement areas because unless you've got someone that's really looking at the finances behind a particular typology that's been investigated there's not a lot we can do as financial institutions or money service businesses to help them uh, understand how those typologies are emerging you know, there's certain industries that do have some sort of um, public sector engagement, like health and safety in construction sites, for instance. Um, you might see um, different organisations, industry bodies involved in, in certain um, high-risk industries. Um, but unless they know what to look for and they're looking at the finances behind what they're seeing, it's very difficult for us to detect that. So I think in order to make it work more smoothly, um, the government needs to invest more in, in that financial investigation side of things. Um, and I think also 
uh, Nick alluded to it earlier about you know us de-risking uh, customers, and and when you look at the the typologies in modern slavery, there's lots of crossover with fraud, uh, and there's certain automated tools that many banks use that when a customer has been exited for fraud reasons, which a lot of these victims would have been, uh, when they try and re-enter, they're immediately stopped without any actual human interaction. Um, so that creates a problem in itself. You know, you have you know financial inclusion issues to think about, the reputation of the bank, and there are genuine people that want to reintegrate themselves um, with, with the financial community, and they're unable to do that because of what's happened to them in the past. So it's very important we work also with um, charities that, that want to help people do that so we can understand who are the genuine victims that need help and how can we reintegrate them and not penalise them for actually being victims of something. So I think having all those different industry bodies and charities and, and the public sector working together, um, I think those for me are like the key things to make things work better in the future. Great. Thank, thanks, George. Um, Nick, we've got about a minute left before we need to wind up. Uh, it'd be great just to hear any other observations you have about ensuring a sort of good relationship in, with the public sector uh, and how this is necessary for disrupting modern slavery within a business. Well, I think, you know, from, from, a, from, a, from a Western Union perspective, I think a lot of the time it's there, there is, everyone has heard of Western Union, but it's not always, I think for us, dispelling some, uh, some myths is key and just, you know, uh, getting over the point that this, this is who we are, this is what we can provide, and just uh, try to dispel some of those those myths and, and, and kind of in, in, uh, try and engender a bit more uh, trust, really. Uh, and what, what George was saying, this crossover, whether with fraud or other crime types, is, is key. And I think, you know, just in human trafficking, the, the, the terminology is vast. You know, there's human smuggling, human trafficking, organised immigration, crime, uh, child exploitation, domestic service. There's a whole... A whole gambit of, of terminology around this and as George says there are definite convergences with other crime types as, as well be it fraud or anything else so is that it just makes a challenging environment even more so but um, and I think you know so those two are key to me as well as um, having those uh, having those good uh, information sharing um, uh, gateways between public and, and private understand the terminologies and and the threats and the future threats, um, and yeah, and the, the de-risking I've already uh, alluded to, as, 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 as has George. Great, thanks Nick. That seems like a good place to end the discussion for now. I'd like to thank Nick Mays, who is Law Enforcement Outreach and Investigations Manager at Western Union, and George Sonaris, who is the Intelligence Lead at the Financial Intelligence Unit at NatWest Group, for joining us today on uh, what has been a really interesting discussion. Thanks both, and thanks very much for tuning in to this Themis podcast. And I hope this has been an informative and valuable podcast for you. A quick shout out, if I may. As a public-private research project, we are developing an industry-wide response, and so we are keen to speak to as many financial institutions as possible so that we can understand current and best practices. Whether you work for a bank or building society, an investment manager, an insurance house, an accountancy firm, a money service or payments business, a regular or crypto exchange, or any other financial institution, we want to hear from you. If you'd like to either participate or sponsor this research, please do get in touch and we would love to talk to you and your team about what you're currently doing to either detect or prevent any links to modern slavery and human trafficking. You can reach me on henry.williams at themisservices.co.uk or find out more via our research website www.crime.financial forward slash msht. Thank you for listening to the latest Themis podcast. We hope you found it interesting and informative. If you would like to find out more about Themis, get in touch with us via our website, www.crime.financial. You can also subscribe for future news and interviews.